Well, some of you owe the library tens of pounds, right? And a couple of mobiles, because we, uh, we heard some mobiles twice. Anyway, as every time I'll go with you, uh, sh uh, just a few uh, uh, statistics about the, uh, uh, this conference. Uh, these are our official partners and the sponsors. You could see, if you could see the number behind there, this is the number of sponsors, 12. If you have good, uh, you know, sharp uh, eyes. And the uh, exhibitors and the institutional supporters. I should uh, mention here that some of our speakers, they paid for their tickets from their own buckets. Without naming them, we have to applaud them separately. <laughs> About the program, we had uh, 28 sessions between panels, plenaries, and roundtables, and the six satellite tracks, Muhammad Yahya just reported on them. Now, I should say this in Arabic. Man antum. Who are you? This is no politics, right? No politics. The participants, uh, we exceeded the 2,000th line this time. Maybe some of you will say, no, we have, I haven't seen 2,000 around. Actually, you're here, other uh, lecture halls and the uh, the biofair and the uh, uh, session, I mean the uh, poster sessions, but some of participants, they paid the, uh, the fees but didn't show, about 10% didn't show. I think this because of some exams are earlier than, than usual. So 48, I'm sorry, 84% uh, percent are fresh graduates, undergraduates, and postgraduate uh, students. 15% are faculty members. Faculty members paid fees and 1% uh, others. For the participants, as usual, <laughs> I told you last time, you remember, you know, they are coming. Be careful, men, right? <laughs> Be careful. Uh, for participants, the uh, 97 are Egyptians and 3% non-Egyptians. We have to work on this. Now for speakers, we have 115 speakers from almost 30 countries from the four corners of the world. Uh, speakers, men win here, right? But as I said last time, they are still coming, right? <laughs> Be careful. Uh, I have some comparison between uh, 2004 uh, conference till today, which are the, uh, uh, the five times. Sometimes we say this is the sixth edition or fifth edition because the first real uh, biotechnology conference was 2002. It was named then Biotechnology Egypt. Then we're not in, in cooperation with Biovision Lyon yet. So it's goes both ways. The participants started with 2004, where it's just nine, 900, actually 900 unpaid participants, because then we were not charging anyone any, any money. But when you are charged, you come. Actually, it's free. It's, it's, not, it's not working with Egyptians. Sorry to say that, but we, we reached almost more than uh, uh, two times the, the beginning of our uh, number. For the speakers, they are a little less than, than before, and this is because we have squeezed a little bit the, uh, the program, and instead of having four speakers per session, we worked on three speakers per session. And I think also the, uh, what is going on in the country because of the revolution has some effect there too. Uh, the Nobel laureates, uh, we had between three and five every time. This is the 2004. 2006, 2008, 2010, 2012, and this time for the first time we had uh, video messages from two Nobel laureates and uh, live 
uh, uh, conference, video, video conferencing. Now, the closing keynote address, and here I will not say any more except that I ask you to join me to welcome our biovisionary, biovisionist, our boss and everything, Dr. Smail Sragidi. Thank you, Mohammed Waham. Thank you all for being here. A long and arduous journey. Ladies and gentlemen, we have now come to the conclusion of our deliberations. And you have heard from the rapporteurs the highlights of the many sessions we have had the privilege of attending and the many excellent papers and the insightful speakers we have had the pleasure of listening to. I will ask your indulgence in the final occasion to share with you some ideas that I hope you will take home from this conference. And as I extend special thanks to our speakers and to all of you, our participants, I would also like to give special thanks to a few particular individuals who I believe deserve our recognition. We have to recognize those who labored long and hard to make this conference possible, and in particular, whether it is from security to audiovisual, from travel to transport, from building maintenance to flower arrangements, from ICT to our interpreters, uh, from secretariat to publications to media, I think many people have worked very hard and all deserve our recognition, but in particular, there is a small team that was dedicated for this conference. Many of them are volunteers and friends of the library and some are staff, and I see them over here. So I think please stand up, all of you, and be recognized for your labors. And having said that, however, and as usual, he, they are going to argue with me, but I think you will all agree with me that there are two individuals who deserve even more special attention, and that is Marwa Al-Wakil and Muhammad Faham. Thank you all for sharing with me because I would not have felt satisfied had we not been able to at least express collectively our debt to all those who made this possible. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I started this conference with a presentation about the changing structure and content of knowledge. And I even quoted T.S. Eliot who asked a century ago, where is the life we have lost in living? Where is the wisdom we have lost in knowledge? Where is the knowledge we have lost in information? And so, as we come to the end of this conference, I would like to pick up that theme and quote another poet, a lady, uh, Edna St. Vincent Millay, who also about a century ago said, Upon this gifted age in its dark hour falls from the sky a meteoric shower of facts. They lie unquestioned, uncombined. Wisdom enough to leech us of our ill is daily spun, but there exists no loom to weave it into fabric. I believe the science 
is the loom that weaves all of this into a viable fabric. And so allow me in these concluding remarks to address five points. First, the nature of the quest of science today. Second, the frightening divide between the two cultures of the natural and social sciences. Third, the conditions that we need for a great leap as we go forward into the next stage of our existence. Fourth, the ethics that must govern the relationship between science and the public interest. And fifth, how about going forward? So on the role of science, of course, along with Bronowski, one of the people I admire a lot, I believe that science is the harnessing of knowledge so that we can command a greater return from nature, from the forces of nature, we understand them better. And from a very long time ago, possibly from Thales and maybe even before, and all the way through the ancient library of Alexandria, that has been the quest of science. Precision, measurement, understanding. Astronomy and mathematics flourished right here in the library of Alexandria. Many of you may not know this, but not only did we have the first human being anywhere in the world who actually said that the earth revolves around the sun was Aristarchus of Samos right here in the library of Alexandria. The proof of the earth being spherical and the calculation of the circumference of the earth by Eratosthenes, the third director of the ancient library. And as a visiting professor in the ancient library, we had no less than Archimedes himself being here. Regretfully, the vision of Aristarchus that the sun was at the center of the heavens, the heliocentric cosmology, was abandoned to another great, great astronomer, Claudius Ptolemy, 180 AD, also here in the Library of Alexandria, who produced the Ptolemaic system, which was to govern world understanding for a thousand years or more, actually closer to 1400 years. And it was only after the revolution of Copernicus and Kepler and others that the heliocentric system returned. Even though in the midst of that, the Arabs and Muslims had made major contributions to our understanding of mathematics and astronomy. Why did it take so long to return to the original thoughts of Aristarchus when he said the earth revolves around the sun, not the other way around? Well, for one thing, it is not that people were just stubborn, is that the conclusions weren't obvious. I mean, if you look and you live on the earth and you observe that the sun gets out, goes, lands on the other side, so you sort of naturally assume the sun goes around. Secondly, there was a very strong presumption that the earth is at the center of everything for the simple reason of gravity. Anything you drop seems to fall to earth. It seems to attract everything. There is nothing that when you put it down suddenly flies out to the sun. So why should the sun be the center of the cosmology? So what I mean to say that contrary to what people read today about how these debates were profoundly religious debates against scientific debates, even though in certain times, yes, church took positions on some of these issues. But fundamentally, there were arguments between scientists about evidence and the accuracy of measurement. And it was not just that the works of Tusi and Ibn Shatter and so on were picked up later on by Copernicus. It was also that we needed the elliptical view of Kepler. And only when Newton provided the force of gravity that we have a new cosmology that ultimately swept everything before it. And that is how, 
science has advanced through all these centuries. That's how science was built here in the ancient library, and that's what we hope we will reassert in the new library of Alexandria. And science is based, as you all know, on the scientific method, on the empirical method. I discussed in my opening speech Ibn al-Haytham, who six centuries before Baker and Descartes and Galileo actually presented this empirical method. And that method was adopted with marvelous results when the torch of knowledge passed on to Europe from the 16th century or 17th century onward. But surprisingly, these people were not referred to as scientists, even though the word science existed. They were referred to as natural philosophers, for it was seen as a form of philosophy. After all, one of the greatest minds of all time, Aristotle, was considered a philosopher. And the word scientists should be interested to know is quite new in the English language. It entered the language in 1840, almost the middle of the 19th century, when the polymath William Wewell, a brilliant philosopher mathematician, said that uh, we need very much a name to describe a cultivator of science. I should incline to call him a scientist, 1840. And that's when the word scientist came into the language. Even more surprisingly for many people, R&D, research and development, enters the language only in 1923. It's not even a century old. That was when this emerging community of cultivators of science in general, for whom the 20th century would create great institutions in terms of labs and universities, the language entered when the partnership with private business emerged and private business invested in scientific research in a big way and it became R&D. And that has been a partnership that has brought about incredibly rapid change everywhere on the planet. We have had enormous achievements in one lifetime. Science, technology, and innovation, STI as we call it, has taken us from no machine flight in 1903 to landing on the moon in 1969. 66 years, one lifetime. The power of computers, as you all know, has increased by many orders of magnitude. We are manipulating the very building blocks of life, which is one of the topics we talked about here at length in this conference. We probe the innermost recesses of the atom. and We explore the farthest reaches of the cosmos. And in all this, this quest, this amazing quest, as Bruce Albers reminded the young people when he showed all the areas that remain to be explored, this is nothing new for great scientists have known this at all times. The more we discover, the less we know. And Newton, the great Newton, after he wrote his magnificent magisterial Principia Mathematica, uh, he said to those who told him that he saw everything, First, he said, I've seen father because I've stood on the shoulders of giants. But more importantly, he said, I was like a boy playing on the seashore and diverting myself now and then by finding a smoother pebble or a prettier shell than ordinary, whilst the great ocean of truth lay all undiscovered before me. So what are we doing when we look where we are today. Today, science is a quest. It is a quest where every time you answer something, you raise new questions. It is a quest where achievements are better measured, not in the finality of the answers, but in the fertility of the questions that they raise. So let us all enjoy the quest together. But as our world becomes ever more complex, and our abilities become ever more powerful, we need more than the powerful arsenal of the natural sciences, the tools of mathematics, 
and the acumen of the computing and information sciences. We will need the wisdom of the humanities and the insights of the social sciences. So we must bring the social and natural sciences closer together in both theory and practice. And that's my now coming to my second point, which I would emphasize. If it exists today as a problem throughout the West and in the world, let me tell you that it is a far greater problem in Egypt, where in the, our university system, the humanities and the social sciences are almost totally divorced, totally divorced from the natural sciences. Now, those of you who know their history of science will recognize that the great C.P. Snow wrote about the two cultures over half a century ago. He bemoaned the degree of ignorance, even rising enmity between the culture of science and the culture of the humanities. The ignorance of each about the other was noticeable then, but it has grown since then a lot. Today, that non-science culture has mutated into a variety of groups all sharing the same level of ignorance about the basics of science, and some of them are gravitating towards a fundamentally anti-science attitude. Many deny that science is anything more than just another discourse reflecting the power relationship of society in keeping with what many of my French postmodernist friends like to say. And that is practitioners, the scientists, are no more than another social group vying for resources and power. They politicize debate. They reject evidence. But science is different. We lose sight of that difference at our own peril. In science, there is no individual authority, no book that governs right or wrong, no high priest that interpret any text. There is a method, a method based on rationality and evidence. The method that I read you descriptions from Ibn al-Haytham about and many others. Science encourages the engagement with the contrarian view as I cited to you Ibn Nafis and what he said, and hails the overthrow of an existing paradigm and conceptions as breakthroughs. We are proud when somebody destroys what we believe in in science because that is how science advances. Our respect for Newton is not diminished by the fact that Einstein recast the perception of the cosmos and our respect for Einstein will not be diminished when somebody else explains dark matter and dark energy and maybe comes up with something totally new. We remain open to these contrarian views. We expect and hope that there will be transformations and when they do happen, we arbitrate differences with evidence. We have a method for settling disputes in science. Recently, you may recall, the media cited that neutrinos had been measured flying from the Large Hadron Collider in, in, in uh, Geneva to the Gran Sasso in Italy faster than the speed of light. And everybody started saying Einstein was wrong, the theory of physics is wrong, everything we know is wrong. Media had programs everywhere. But I looked up the actual paper. The scientists who reported that did not make that claim. They were true scientists. They said, we did an experiment. We measured it. We repeated it, the measurement once, twice, three times. And we have an anomaly that we cannot explain. And here is our data. And please, colleagues, if somebody can explain why we're getting this result, we'd like to know. Now, of course, inherently, if that result was sustained, then it would have been really a transformation of our understanding because, as you all know, according to the theory of relativity, no information can fly faster than the speed of light anywhere. Well, it turns out that there were 
magnetic waves that interfered with the measurement clocks in that experiment. And people are not upset. They accept that this is the way we arbitrate disputes. It's not a matter of insisting on your point of view. That's something unique about science. Now, this is a method based on rationality and evidence, and a method that allows different points of views. It's a method that allows everybody to challenge the existing views. And guess what? Most of those who challenge the views and who change the perceptions are very young. Einstein was 26 when he published his revolutionary papers in 1905. Watson was 25 when he co-wrote that little paper with Francis Crick about the structure of DNA. All hailed for their discoveries, and they are in the pantheon of the great scientists. But powerful as the empirical method is, it is not enough to deal with many of our problems, which are not just individual or systemic, but also social and environmental, local and global. And here we need the insights of the social sciences and the wisdom of the humanities. We need to bridge the two cultures as never before. Now, the methods of the mainstream social sciences may differ from those of the natural sciences, but their scholarship is not in doubt. Usually more qualitative than quantitative, the social sciences tend to description rather than prescription and avoid generalization across societies, with the obvious exception of cross-sectional economic studies. There's been a long-standing concern in quantification in the social sciences from the time of Laplace and Quetelet to Walter Isard. But mathematical theories in the social sciences are few. They frequently use narrative, they use analytical constructs that are different, but that doesn't mean that their insights are any less important. At present, many of the problems of our time, from gender to medical issues, from the deployment of technology to environment, from social cohesion to international peace, they focus attention on human individuals and societies as much as on the natural world in which we live. Now, human beings are social beings, living things that have motives, intentions, norms, and values, whose social institutions have meaning, symbols, rituals, and cultures. All of that is not directly measurable, but has to be inferred from observation. And these are precisely the contributions of the social scientists. And so, for the benefit of humanity, in this new century, we must bridge this rift between the two cultures. We must be able to bring their different and complementary insights to bear on the great problems of our time. Now, the third part is, or the third theme, is what sort of climate do we need to create for that next great leap for humanity? We are living in the dawn of the age of biology. We're still at the very beginning of it. And the new revolutionary transformations in our understanding and our capabilities are opening vistas and raising challenges as never before. This new biological revolution will bring marvels in production and allow us to produce in ways that do not consume or pollute at anything like the levels of the past but it will also bring speedy and accelerating change in the global scene. And the future will belong to those who are educated, the nimble, and the powerful, to those learning societies and nations that have the capacity to acquire, process, and use knowledge more swiftly, and then be in a position to contribute that knowledge so they can access knowledge and become part of that global network of knowledge producers and consumers that the world is rapidly becoming. In our own time, the issues are becoming more complex. For the first time, the new technologies and the new breakthroughs are enabling us to fathom the very composition of matter. As I said, to tinker with the building blocks of life. We are, as we saw, as we saw in this conference, for the first time, communicating by thought, nervous system to nervous system. We are creating robots that have unheard of levels of autonomy before that. We are sending probes to other planets 
and impacting on our own climate with potentially disastrous results. A huge explosion in humanity's presence on the planet, our footprint on the planet, has meant that we have appropriated ever more of the habitats of other species with important reductions in biodiversity. The pollution that our agricultural and industrial processes engender is testing the limits of nature's ability to recycle them. Never before has the ability to change the world for the better been more present. And yet, never before have the risks of human action and human inaction, inaction been greater. So we must harness the scientific revolution for the benign development of the planet for humanity and other species as opposed to the rapacious misuse of technology for short-term consumption. We need a new ethics of science and technology. And that brings me to my fourth and penultimate point, which is how to link science with the public interest. Because the pace of scientific discovery has never been greater, and it is accelerating at a very, very fast pace, it's important that the practice of scientific research be governed by certain values and ethical constructs. Not everything that is technically feasible is ethically desirable. Such concerns run in an unbroken line from the times of the Nazi medical experiments on human beings all the way to animal rights movements in our time. It reminds us of the need to have sensible ways of governing the essential, desirable, and unstoppable pursuit of knowledge. Now here are a few basic parameters that I think we need to recognize. First, we should be clear about the boundaries between the private sector and the public good. By definition, in economic terms, public goods that are non-excludable and non-rival require public investment and should be undertaken in the name of the public interest because we cannot expect that the private sector will do it on their own. Now, these are important considerations when we come to the issues of intellectual property rights regimes, but those who speak exclusively of market forces forget that Adam Smith, he of the invisible hand, the famous invisible hand, also wrote in The Wealth of Nations that the state is responsible for erecting and maintaining those public institutions and those public works which, though they may be in the highest degree advantageous to a great society, are, however, of such a nature that the profit could never repay the expense to any individual or small number of individuals, and therefore we cannot expect that any individual or such small number of individuals should erect or maintain. So he recognized the public good and the responsibility of the state. Supporting universities, supporting basic research, supporting public goods development and research, that is a fundamental thing that the public must do. And we talked about public-private partnerships many times in this conference. Second, the codes of conduct for research should be developed by those with a profound understanding of the scientific issues in conjunction with the representatives of society at large. I mean, people who design the regulations have to understand the science. It cannot be imposed from outside, ignoring the evidence before us. A prime example of successful codes of conduct, as we mentioned on other occasions here in this conference, were the Azilomar conference of the early 70s that established the accepted norms of the conduct of recombinant DNA research and which led to the absence of accidents in the last four decades. Third, the development of a regime to conduct scientific research should address a multiplicity of issues, not just one or another issue. Thus, public safety, moral repugnance, risk, uncertainty are all elements that enter into the debate. And here it's going to be very important to disentangle the issues and involve the right cast of characters in each debate and then bring them together again for a coherent and balanced consensus of the majority, recognizing that there will never be 
a unanimity, a 100% agreement on the kind of issues that are raised by today's scientific research. Fourth, we must avoid one size fits all. The need of the different branches of science are enormously varied, as are the types of issues that they raise. Thus, an open discussion of each set of issues and a flexible approach are needed. And fifth, an ongoing review of the new evidence is needed to constantly reassess the decisions of the past. It's not that we have had this regulation and therefore it's going to be good forever. No, we need to see what we are doing. For example, some things that were thought to be benign, we saw their long-term effects differently. For example, the impact on Madame Curie's exposure to radioactivity. I mean, that was just one example. In other cases, certain fears that people had proved to be uh, unfounded, such as the fear that a chain reaction would be generated and scientists wouldn't be able to control it. Or, more recently, as some people raised the fears that the Large Hadron Collider in CERN was going to create a black hole here on Earth and do all sorts of things. So we need to review that. And again, as scientists, we must arbitrate with evidence and rationality. Now, regulating technology is slightly different because here it's not just the regulation of the research, it's here is the issue of how do you apply the science. And the vision for me of the late Norman Borlaug, who passed away, and Malcolm Elliott here is uh, found the, the, the Borlaug Institute, will tell you that this Nobel Prize winning scientist who did so much to feed the world understood what we are talking about in linking science to society. And he was always out in the farmer's fields and his dying words on his deathbed when somebody was telling him about new breakthroughs was, get it out to the farmers now. So the vision of the partnership between the farmer in her field with her practical wisdom honed through the centuries and the scientist in the lab coat working at some of the cutting edge uh, uh, issues in the laboratory is a real and viable partnership. They are not worlds apart at all. They are working on how to make that knowledge useful, how to transform science into technology. So we must see science beyond that, not just governed by the scientific values, it is an integral part of our culture. It informs our worldview. It affects our behavior. Science has the capacity to capture the imagination, to move the emotion, and it promotes fundamental ethical values, which I described in my opening address as the values of science. Science is a cultural current that brings imagination and vision to bear on concrete problems and theoretical speculation. After all, in Blake's immortal phrase, what is now proved was once only imagined. And the imagination and vision are at the very heart of the scientific enterprise, even though to advance we need the empirical evidence and to arbitrate disputes with evidence. The ethics in the application of science are important, and today they have become more important because of the role of intellectual property rights and the legal, environmental, and social issues that they raise. So these issues require that the regimes for the application of regulations to science and technology, from the patent regime to the trade regime of the world, must be, in my judgment, science-based, that evidence-based. And it is wrong to have a separation of perspectives because it leads to some indefensible activities. For example, in the United States, the government was leading a war against smoking. At the same time, another part of that government in international discussions bearing on trade was arguing that developing countries should lower their taxes to allow the tobacco companies 
to sell in the name of free trade. Uh, some inconsistencies here. Why? Because there are different parts, one negotiating an economic agreement and other people uh, negotiating something based on public health. And this requires to be brought in. And that leads, of course, to the issue of what do we do about the precautionary principle. It has been much touted, it deserves to be used, but, but, as Philippe Kurilski said in his famous report to Prime Minister, then Prime Minister Jospin, that it has to be in the form of a comparative evaluation of alternative technologies. Because the issue is not, is there a risk in this new technology versus zero risk? It is, is there, how much of a risk is there in this new technology against the continuation of the present technology which has known and measurable risks? So here is the issue. It's not against some abstract measure of zero risk. It is against a situation that exists and where we need improvement. And therefore, what we need is a regulation that is balanced, fair, efficient, and effective. Now, all of these, these four qualities are not the same, but that is a topic for a lecture on its own or even a conference on its own. But such regulatory regimes, I emphasize again, must be designed by knowledgeable people and have the support of society if they are to achieve their purpose, which cannot be to block the pursuit of scientific endeavor, or we will not be able to effectively meet the needs of nine billion human beings on this planet without destroying our ecosystems. Now this requires that science regains its position to provide the scientific evidence around which social debates occur. We cannot have the debates based on some who deny the facts as we know them and others who assert them. People are entitled to their opinions but they're not entitled to their own facts. I mean, we have to establish what the facts are and then have a debate on that. Now, that is what the basis of a civil discourse in a pluralistic society is all about. And this requires that the civil society everywhere act not as opponents of science and technology, but as the voice of the global conscience that reminds us the world we need to have the results of science harnessed to the needs of the many not just the desires of the few. But the burden of this social and global dialogue is large. For today, regretfully, as the world explores the marvels of the genes and breaks down the secrets of the atom and reaches to the stars and calculates the age of the oldest rocks, many are unable to cope and regress, looking with suspicion on the new and trying to erect barriers to limit where the mind may range. So this will require liberating the mind from the fear of the different, the new, and the foreign, and the promotion of the respect of diversity in a shared collectivity. These are values inherent in the scientific outlook, which promotes the bonds that transcend race and culture to reshape culture in the broader, more tolerant framework of humanity. And so, my last point to go forward. Today, sadly, the collective human leadership and all our societies are unable to meet the first of the Millennium Development Goals which we set ourselves back in 2000, which was to reduce poverty and hunger by half in 15 years. Today, there is no way we're going to meet that target. We're trying to limit the damage. Tens of thousands of people die from hunger-related causes every day, and many of the poor who survive lack access to the fundamental needs of a decent existence. Over a billion people are compelled to live on less than a dollar a day, and a sixth or more of the human family live in a marginalized existence. But that's not all. The marine fisheries of the world are grossly overexploited. The soils are rapidly eroding in many parts of the world. Water is becoming scarcer as underground aquifers are drawn down, deforestation is still very much a problem, the global challenge of desertification, climate change, and the potential loss of biodiversity demand redoubled efforts 
Agriculture must be transformed to promote sustainable food security for the billions of food insecure in the world and the urban poverty and environmental challenge posed by the developing world is enormous as urban populations in the developing countries are going to treble, treble within one generation. Now therein lies the challenge before us. Will we accept such human degradation as inevitable or will we strive to help, in Franz Fanon's evocative phrase, the wretched of the earth? Will we accept that we are no longer responsible for future generations or will we try to act as true stewards of the earth? Now, science is the key to the future. An ethical outlook to science in this new century is what will allow the full potential of scientific discovery for the benefit of the world to be unleashed. We need this ethical approach to scientific inquiry and we need more than ever to create a space of freedom for the scientists to explore and for the innovators and entrepreneurs to invent the new. Let us encourage all of that. Let us break down the barriers between nations that deny our common humanity. And while doing all this, let us think of the unborn, remember the forgotten, give hope to the forlorn, reach out to the unreached, and by wise actions today, lay the foundations for better tomorrows. And I hope that this conference has contributed to these worthy goals and that it added to your own knowledge and that it enabled you to make new friends. And so, with that, I bid you all farewell and good travels, and thank you very much for having honored us here.